It is the Blue Room. It is the weekly show. Uh, I never said I haven't played for a while, but still plenty to talk about. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you'll be able to see. Got four guests to start us off today. Uh, Les Roberts, Patrick Widge, and uh, Peter McFarlane. But join us for the first 15 minutes of the show. Uh, Everton great. Uh, one of our favourite guests to get on all the time. It's Super Kev Campbell. Kev, how are you doing, mate? I'm really good, Matt. Uh, thanks for having me on, guys. And hi to Les, Patrick and Peter. And all the bo- all the people joining, so hopefully let's make it a good fifteen. Yeah, fifteen minutes. So we've got you a very busy man. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, uh, before it'd be great to, to get you on. Obviously, we'll, we'll have a, a little chat about the Blues now we're getting on in, in general. But before you shoot off, but um, first and foremost, Kev, I thought it'd be nice to, to have a chat about Wayne Rooney, and who obviously retired from from playing uh, earlier this week, gone on to, to manage Derby County. Now he, he's hung up his boots. Um, First and foremost, just want to ask you, can you believe that that 16-year-old lad who burst into the, the first-team squad has had a whole career and, and hung them up? Because it, it certainly makes me feel old looking back on his career. And seeing oh, don't start all that, Matt, with me. I'm <laughs> telling you, geez. Look, like I said uh, previously, you know, I, the first time I ever played with Wayne, he was 14 years old. So to look now and to see him, his trajectory throughout his career and, and, and now he's hung them up to, to manage... You know, it's remarkable. He's had a remarkable career. He's been a, a fantastic footballer for England. And, you know, he's, he's broken records. He's done all the bits and pieces. And he's still a blue, which, which, which I love. Obviously, he's gone through some tough times as well. But in general, you know, he's, 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 he's made his mark in the game. And uh, what a fantastic guy as well. Brilliant. And I'm so pr- I'm pleased and I'm proud. Um, that you know, we I, I played with him and uh, I captained him and stuff like that. So, yeah, what a what a lovely lad. Yeah, and before we, we throw it to the other lads, because I know they've got some questions for you about this as well. You say there about being proud of, of him, and you know, I remember when he first burst into the side. You know, there's that famous picture of the two of you, isn't mm-hmm. there? After the, uh, the Arsenal game where he's on you on your back, yeah, you give yeah. him a bit of piggyback. Did, were you? Did you sort of take it upon yourself? to be a bit of a mentor to him when he first came into the side or was it sort of like a, a natural gravitation between the two years? Well, I, I'm, I'm captain, so, you know, I've got to deal with everybody. And uh, well, he's a likeable lad, Wayne. You know, he was, he was such, a, such a huge talent, um, obviously being at the club. But, you know, he would gravitate to, to the young lads at times and he would gravitate. This is the great thing about Wayne. And he'll gravitate to the more experienced players as well. You know, there was myself, Fergie, uh, Big Dunk, uh, Stubbsy, etc. And Wayne was, he was good with everybody. So I can't really say it, it was really under my remit to put my arm around him. Although I did do that. But, you know, he was just good with everybody. He was a likeable lad. As I said, big talent. And, you know, we knew where he was destined for. Absolutely. Uh, Pete, I'll come to you first, mate. Uh, what are your memories of that, of that time and, and his first spell and, and Wayne and Kev being together up front? Well, I mean, on a personal note, in terms of Wayne Rooney, I remember the first time I saw him on the team sheet. I think it was the, the, the season before, away at Southampton, and he'd been named on the bench. And funnily enough, I'd actually we'd actually played against him um, in a in a match. He, he played for Dallas Cell. I, um, I played for SFX, so we'd sort of played against him, you know, throughout school. Um, so I, I, I was aware of Wayne Rooney before he actually broke into the Everton side. We, you know, you, you were aware of his name in in like that sort of level of, of of you know being in the schools and stuff. You'd always heard about play, players who played for Everton, played for Liverpool, but Wayne Rooney was always one that really stuck out. So I remember the first time I saw him warming up for Everton, I thought, "Wow, this is incredible!" It was the first time I'd seen anyone who I'd personally you know played against or, or played played sort of on the same pitch as who actually then took that step up. Um, but he was an incredible player and incredible talent, and he and he, he certainly did burst onto the scene. Everyone always thinks that you know they refer to the Arsenal game as the game that really sort of um, that, that that put him on the big stage. But he he scored in the cup a, a few uh, you know a few weeks earlier as well. Hadn't he scored twice in the cup? I think against Wrexham. So it was um, incredible, incredible talent. Um, and yet it was it was a very exciting time to be an Evertonian. Yeah, Ken, was that you know Pete mentioned there about how. 
you know, his name was sort of ringing out on Merseyside before he, he played for Everton and it being the first team. Was that was that something that people talked about within the club? You know, were you you see any lads sort of saying in training, you know, there's a young lad in the reserves here that's, that, that's making strides, he's going to be no, playing. No, he didn't. Uh, it, it, this is the great thing and this is the crazy thing. Um, no, there was no real talk about, remember, because Wayne was a schoolboy, don't forget. <laughs> Yeah. So there was no reserve games or anything like that who we were, you know, because the name, but we were, we heard because we speak to a, a, some of the staff that there's a young lad coming through who's good. His name's Wayne Rooney. Great. Okay, fine. So when I ended up playing with him at Southport and Taffy said to me, this is Wayne Rooney. And I'm looking at this kid and I'm thinking, <laughs> the kid's too big for him. You know, it's, it's like, what? but well, left an impression on me and that was two years pr prior. I went back into the dra dressing room and I told the lads, listen, there's this kid Rooney coming up. He should be with us now. Get, get out, Cam, get what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, as soon as he finished school, he came in and one training session, the lads were like, incredible, brilliant talent. Jaws on the floor. Yeah, yeah. jaws on the floor. <laughs> Uh, Lads, go on. Sorry, maybe you're going to make a point there. Just going to say that Puma kit seems to be massive on everyone. That one with the big white. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You could fly that. in that. Couldn't you? you could fly in that. Yeah. One. I was going to say, actually, I was, me and my dad were down at Wrexham when you and uh, Wayne scored in that cup game. Yeah. And obviously, you saw the breakthrough game, as, as Pete said, was that like that Arsenal one with the famous winning goal. Um, but I just want to go back to that Southampton game that Pete was talking about when he was on the bench because I remember at the time. We were all desperate to see him because we'd heard him. You know, he'd, he'd scored that goal against Tottenham in the free kick in the, the, um, the under-18. Yeah. Yeah. He'd scored that. But he was on everyone's radar at this point. <clears throat> Feeling like in the squad, sort of, that he was on the bench with the, an anticipation that he'd play. And how was, how was he sort of acting on the day? Because, as you say, he was a 16-year-old lad going down to Southampton with the team he supported his entire life. And he's got a chance of getting on the pitch, but he didn't quite get to it then. There was no, there was no hullabaloo from him or anything like that. He, he just took everything in his stride. If I'm honest with you, you know, he was, um, he he, I'd, he believed in his talent, and to be on the bench obviously was a was a fantastic honour for him. But I, I don't think I'll be doing it just if if I speak for for Wayne Rooney. All I know is going down to Southampton and having a young protege on the on the bench was a good sign for the football club. That was a really good sign for, for the Blues. And for me, as a player, I love seeing youngsters coming through. Uh, talented youngsters. So, remember, I played with him, so I knew. All the others didn't know. I knew what he could do. So, uh, obviously, a fantastic day, but he was on the radar for the Blues. Yeah. I think, I think as well, Patrick, you, know, you think back to those, certainly Wayne's first fell the football club and and how he went about it. And I think a lot of people, maybe a lot of Evertonians, if you look at this through our royal blue tinted specs, say yeah. that, you know, as a footballer and an individual player, that those were the, the best years of his career, where he was raw, where he'd run at people, where he had blistering speed. Um, it, that that time watching Everton, obviously, it'd been, it'd been difficult. It would have been a lot more difficult had it not been for Kev keeping us up <laughs> when he arrived at the football club a few years before, of course. But it had been difficult. And I just remember that time being just just so thrilling that we had such an incredible player that had come through and he was, he was one of our own. Yeah, I mean, so that season, that 2002-2003 season is the first season that I started watching Everton, the first season that I got into football. Um, my dad was an Evertonian, but the first game I actually went to was Ellen Road when Rooney came off the bench and I think you played in that game Kev I did, yeah. and you know I was seven at the time I think and being kind of from the Leeds area as well it was such a big thing for us to win there 50 odd years I think it'd been since we won at Ellen Road and Rooney came off the bench and just skipped round three or four players and then slotted that into the corner and then that's obviously like two weeks or three weeks after the Arsenal goal and just that ability, I stand by this, that I've never seen a player since that at that age, that 16, 17, 18 years old, was as good as Rooney was at that time. Um, I, you know, I can't really remember Messi, you know, watching Spanish football 15 years ago wasn't like it is now. I can't really me remember Messi at that age, but I can't think that Ronaldo would have been that good. No, what, at that age, at 16, 17, 18, and he was like, like a player in his prime. And just like you mentioned about that rawness and that talent, and I wondered, 
Kev, if there was, you mentioned in that first training session that kind of the entire team realised what you've been saying, that this kid was ready to play. But was there like one moment in a game that you played with Wayne or one moment in a training session that you can remember that made you think like he's got everything in that one kind of moment, one moment that kind of encapsulated Rooney at that, in that first spell at Everton? Uh, not really. I mean, remember, the first time I played with him was 14. Yeah. So, you know, he wasn't even full time. And I was like, <laughs> I was open mouthed. You know, it was it, for it's the rest of the, the squad were, ca- were playing catch up. I knew I was I was lucky to have witnessed it. And normally, you know, uh, when you when you go off, we were playing Southport and when, when you go off as an, I was captain of a football club. When you go off, you just go straight into the dressing room and shower. I sat on the bench. I wanted to watch him. And they moved him <laughs> from striker to wide left. And he absolutely run the show. So yeah. I was just like, wow, this kid is good. He's something special. So, you know, you get in the next day and you tell the lads and the lads are laughing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? What you've been drinking? I said, you will see. And, you know, I, they were asked, some were asking questions and you're telling them like, you know, yeah, you, you play like a first team player. So overs and balls around the corner, little flick ons, little touches. Yeah. He was there. He just knew everything, what to do. You know, defenders were coming in trying to get the ball off him and he was only, he, he looked slight, but he had man strength. He was holding him up. I was like, whoa. Yeah. This little kid here, wow, incredible. So, and he's only going to get stronger and he's only going to get better. My sad part was Everton didn't have the funds to keep him and build. That's the, that's a tough part. And I know David Moyes tried to talk it up that Wayne wanted to leave. He, did, he didn't want to leave. Everton needed the money. And um, that kind of put a bit of a sour taste in, in a lot of Evertonians' mouths at the time that Wayne left, but it wasn't Wayne asking to leave. It was Everton needed the money. So, you know, imagine that him being at Everton for a decade, you know, you could have built something real special around him. Just just quickly, Kev, before we move on to the, to the current team, is, is that a spell or is that a time where he, you, ever, you reached out to yourself? Obviously, you know, coming into the team, you were his first captain in, in senior football. When that was all going on, did he, did he speak to you at all? Did he ask for advice? Did he... Did he Talk yeah, I spoke to him. No, I spoke yeah. to him. Of course, I, I think it's important to to be able to, because remember, he's he's never been through all this. He's a young he's a young kid, and the manager's coming out and saying one thing. Obviously, he's getting different advice from all over. So I said, at the end of the day, Wayne, the bottom line of it is, as long as you know what's going on, and you could tell your story, probably you won't be able to tell your story at first. I said, but you will get your story out there. You will, because that's just the way football works. But because you're so young, you know, you don't want to get caught in front of those media guys and they trip you up. So just be careful, you know, just do, just keep playing your football. I said, let your football do the talking. And wow, he's football done the talking all right. Absolutely, mate. Uh, just before you go, Kev, uh, last couple of minutes, uh, Everton obviously doing fantastically well at the moment, flying high in the, the table there. Uh, as we sit here recording this, I think we're still six, but uh, six points off the top with a, a couple of games in hand. Uh, so it's looking quite rosy for, for Carlo Angelotti's top eight at the moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, Listen, but, let me just say this. Let me just say this. <laughs> Carlo Ancelotti and Big Dunk and all the staff are doing a great job. There's been times where, you know, Richarlison wasn't there and the team never won without Richarlison. Now the team have got over that hump. When Richarlison ain't playing, the team have won. Players have stepped up. Uh, when Alan ain't there or whatever, James Rodriguez ain't there, there's players in the group who have stepped up and they're winning. And, you know, sometimes the momentum gets, gets broken when there's games called off or whatever. But, you know, it gives a chance for Dominic Calvert-Lewin to shake off this hamstring and for players to have, be rested to go again. So, fingers crossed, Everton could have a right goal. Obviously, next game is Sheffield Wednesday, isn't it, in the FA Cup. Want to have a cup run? For sure. Definitely do. Um, but, you know, what a great job Carlo Ancelotti is doing. And he's, he's, building, he's building a squad. He is building a squad. Obviously, there is 
he needs more players. He does need more quality in there. But you could start seeing a squad come together now, can't we? Yeah, it's exciting, mate. Absolutely. Uh, I won't ask you for a prediction of where we're going to finish or anything like that. Uh, like you said, it's probably best we go under the radar for, for the time. Yeah, but... I'd, I'd rather listen. When we get to March, I come back on. Absolutely. I'll just. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You heard it here. Oh, when it comes to March, <laughs> listen, I could shout from there. Oh, Kev will be five points clear by then, mate. So it won't even be that exciting. I don't say that. Posting <laughs> to it, but uh, yeah, always appreciate your time, mate, and your thoughts. Thanks very much for coming on, and uh, like you said, we'll speak to you again in March. No problem. Take care, guys. Cheers. See you later. Yeah. Kev. See, See you. Later, Kev. Bye. 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 Uh, Bye. Kevin Campbell there, uh, Everton. Great. Uh, yeah, wonderful stuff. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about you lads. I sort of hinted at it there with, with Kev, but really retiring did make me feel. Very old. I think the first player of a breaking through really as a teenager was of the same sort of age, a little bit older than me, but it's, you know, he's had a whole career along in the moment. It's a bit like... <laughs> the like for me is, nothing, nothing will make me feel any older than the Everton manager being younger than me, which was the case when Bill was in charge. So I've, I've crossed that route. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I mean, just just, just, just on his, obviously, Kev spoke about the, the early days there and, and him coming through and, and the excitement and you know obviously all of his career was, was spent away from Everton I think it's probably fair to say he's an England legend the Man United legend but but not an Everton one and um, I'll just sort of look back at his at his time and, and his links with Everton feet because it's been it's been a bit of a, a troubled time hasn't it I think especially when he left in those early days as, as we spoke about there but gradually he's rebuilt those links uh, the second spell wasn't quite what we all hoped and, and dreamed it would be, but Wayne Rooney and Everton feel like they're on good terms going forward, at least. Yeah, I think he, he started building bridges a couple of seasons before he came back. Um, I think there was a lot of bad blood, a, lot, a bit of taste, a bit of taste left in, in our mouths after he, he celebrated in front of the park end when he scored his first goal against us. Um, but he did start sort of trying to build bridges. He was posting a lot of photos, you know, of his kids wearing wearing their Everton shirts and. Um, you know, he, he played in, in Big Dunk's testimonial as well. So there was, he, he'd, he'd sort of started putting in place um, the, the potential of him coming back. Um, I think he'll, he'll be, he'll, he can, he can be put there on the pedestal of, of what is possible for, for our academy. And that's the best way I can put the, the, the biggest positive I can think um, is that, you know, if you're a, if you're a young player, a young up and coming player, um, what better, attraction to get bring them to our academy than to say we made Wayne Rooney do you know what I mean um I, I think I think he, you know the records his records speak for themselves his record with England his record with Manchester United um you know he's the all-time leading scorer for, for England and Man, Man United and he was made in Everton so um if we can if we can make a player even half as good as him in the in the coming years then then uh, you know we'll be very lucky um but yeah I think there's a, there's always going to be a, a, a massive element of of regret, um, and also a massive you know what if if he could have stayed if he would have stayed would he have would he have taken us to the next level, um, you know it's one of those things um, it it's it's a it's a huge shame that we never got to see him in Ever you know at Everton for a, for a, a huge chunk of his career but you know we enjoyed it when he was there. Yeah, I think when you look back, uh, Patrick as well. 30 million or was it 27 million plus add-ons for, for Man United was yeah. a bit of a snip, wasn't it really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you imagine what that would be now, you know, for a Premier League, you just kind of think it's totally different. It's almost like a different game in, in terms of the financial side of it. It's like totally alien that a player of that much quality would go for something like 27 million. But not even, is that half a Gilfie Sigurd, Sigurdsson, maybe? <laughs> you know, like it's, yeah. it's, and I don't, you know, I don't mind Gilfie, but, you know, it's just, you'd be looking at, if a player like that now came through at a Premier League club, you're looking at 100, 150 million, that kind of quality. Because he was that good. I stand by it. Like, that year of 2004 tournament, he was just on a different level to every other player at that tournament. And there was some unbelievable players across that across that kind of um, competition. And, I mean, that England team, he got injured, didn't he, again? against Portugal in the quarterfinal. He got injured in that one and sent off in the 2006 one, didn't he? And, um, I mean, I, I think, yeah, England would have got to the final in that if Rooney hadn't got injured in that game because he was so instrumental and he is, he's that kind of, he was that Mbappe level, but I think a level above. And 
yeah, like like um, like Pete mentioned, there's always going to be that um, regret kind of, and I think I think we noticed it as well in kind of the reaction to him retiring in a way. It was kind of very below par, maybe because he's gone straight into management and he's kind of been doing that role for the last few months anyway. But he was so good for so long, and maybe he won't get the recognition he deserves, even though he has got all these, you know. Uh, um, records of England's top goal scorer, Man United's top goal scorer. He maybe won't get the recognition he deserves because at Man United, it almost felt like he was never quite the key player. Um, and then when it came to England in his later years, with it was always that he was going into a tournament, he'd always be injured or he'd not been playing well in the few months before that and everything was on his shoulders. And it kind of feels like because of all that coming together, he'll never maybe get the respect he deserves further down the line for just how good he was. Like you think of that United team in 07 to 09 and it was Ronaldo's team really, but it wouldn't have worked without Rooney. So it's it's one of them really. And yeah, if he'd have stayed at Everton, he would have probably been able to make, it might've been like, you know, Maradona-esque at Napoli. Do you know what I mean? That kind of <laughs> elevating, maybe not quite to that standard and you hope without all the, the stuff on the side as well, but um, less mafia involved. But, you know, it had been... <laughs> Maybe that level of taking taking a team from one place to, you know, the very challenging for the top honours. So, but a, a brilliant player, and I hope he does well in management as well. And I liked him in his second spell with us, but I think that, that's more because, kind of that sentimentality. Yeah, it felt like those first two games we scored against Stoke and scored at City. It felt like this is going to be mm. amazing. He's gonna he's gonna fire us to the top four or whatever. But obviously, being quite, I, I think he's. he's a, yeah, sorry, sorry about it. It's easy to forget as well. The first half of that season, it was probably our only bright spark, really. Yeah. You know, yeah. he carried that team on and then obviously Allardyce came in and we, we kind of know the rest and it's just a shame it ended the way it did. Yeah, uh, just yeah, I suppose in, in some, just to, to round this off, Les, you know, I think we can, we can sit here and say you came through at the wrong time for the football club in regards to the team and, and that kind of thing. But in the same breath, you could say you came through at the, the right time because... As Kev alluded to there, I think it's sort of been well disclosed now that it was it wasn't just Man United coming in and, and you know hooking Rooney away from us. There was a bit of Everton nudging him out the door to, to fill some uh, to, you know to make some financial spreads look a little bit better. Yeah, it's it, it's always been. I've never felt so heartbreaking at a player leaving. So think about six years beforehand, we had Barnby doing us over and going to the Reds, and that was like right. I can't believe this. This has done me head right, and I was finished with England at that point. Because I was convinced once he'd gone to England, he'd been tapped up by the Reds and he went. Rooney came along and as you say, he part in that, that 2004 tournament, he was absolutely electric. And sort of England were back on my radar again. And I was like, all right, okay, so I can get on board with this again. And then he went to Man United, so I completely fell out with England. Yeah. And <laughs> a lot of animosity towards Rooney for years, especially as Pete said, when he scored that goal at the park end, we were like, he celebrated right across where we sit. And it was just the most infuriating thing ever. I think the disappointment for me, though, is that he could have elevated uh, a mediocre side to do some damage in the league. Not necessarily win the thing, but maybe trouble the European and Champions League spots, which we did with lesser players the season after. It, it's always like if he'd have just held on a season or two longer, it was two, three years till he was 20. He left when he was 18. It's like the potential he had at that yeah. point. He didn't have to leave them, but obviously, as Kev said, the club kind of pushed him out the door and it's, you know, you kind of think what he went through then at that point. You know, for us as fans, we never really look at it from the player's point of view or very rarely and we're all upset and pissed off the fact that he, he's gone seemingly at the first opportunity but then you think, you know, if he's gotten to the Everton team, he's doing well in the Everton team, the team he supports all his life, all his family supports, to then feel pushed out the door, I guess, in that respect, you would you would maybe celebrate like that at Goodison. I wouldn't do it at the fans. But I'd be, I'd be thinking about it, yeah, I want to stick one over the club at this point. It's, it's, <coughs> it's, you'll never know, as Kev said, if he, if he does his autobiography and it all comes out in the wash, then we'll know. But the animosity will always be there, I think, just because of the way it was handled. Yeah, it was, there, was so, there was so much venom, wasn't there, at the time? I mean, you think back to some of those early games when he came back. You know, there's there two in the season he left, wasn't there? They beat us in the cup. Yeah. You know, and I, I think I've said this on a show before. I always remember they had a couple on the pitch who'd won like a sponsor's award or something or like a raffle. 
and the girl shouted at him as he was going off, like shouting something. <laughs> as he was going off, he showed it on, on the telly. It was like, oh my god, you know, these are just they're on like a bit of a corporate do, and they've won, they've won some rap, <laughs> and even they're giving him stick. I think, I think the thing is, and that then you've got. You can't, sorry, just quickly, you can't under you can't understate the impact that had on the entire fan base because, as you said, we were in a rotten position. Basically, Moyes came in and turned around. This was like a real hope that, like, a player of ours has come through. He's potentially going to be the best in the world, and he's our player, and he supports Everton, and he was like every one of us on the pitch, like kind of cliche. So when he left, it made it even worse. The fact he went to United and became their sort of pet scouser annoyed me as well because they never, ever really, truly talk to him. And I'm, com- I'm convinced it's because he's a scouser and there's the whole Manchester-Liverpool thing. And it mm. just, the whole thing just left a really bad taste. Sorry, back one. No, no, it, I was just kind of, one of the memories I've got from when Rooney left, I mean, I was devastated. Because like that, that England, that 2004 tournament, I kind of got into football at the 2002 World Cup and then that, that 2004 Euros was like, the first tournament I just watched religiously all the way through and I had like my Rooney England shirt, you know, and so it was like, that was like, you Les, uh, said, Les, it was like, that's our player doing these things on the world stage and being the best player at that tournament, the best player in Europe in that particular few weeks and just tearing it up. And then I re- vividly remember when Rooney got sold, they were interviewing fans outside the ground and I just got this, this guy, probably, you know, like, in his 20s or 30s, because Rooney had said once a blue, always a blue ante, and he basically just disowned Rooney on Sky News or Sky Sports News or BBC, whatever it was, and kind of the venom then. And then when he came back that 2005-2006 season, he scored that goal that he celebrated. I just think, like like you mentioned, with the fan on the pitch and the corporate, um, you know, the corporate dude, Matt, like giving him abuse, the lad were 19 or 20 at that age. And it's like, we do forget that, I know he kind of left on it. It was awful for us, but how is a 20-year-old lad going to feel that he, this is his fan base and his club and he's gone back and it's just 40,000 people screaming at him? If you score, I can't really... I, you know, I think we'd all in that situation, and especially with the fans not knowing everything, so you're the bad guy, we'd all in that situation kind of take out your aggression in some way, wouldn't you? And, and I've seen some tweets and things still like kind of from people still can't get over that thing that happened 15 years ago <laughs> when he was 20. And it's like, you just kind of move on. And I think that when he came, like you said, Peter, when he kind of started planting the seeds about coming back, people kind of got over it by then. But there were some people that definitely never did and could never take to him even when he came back. And, you know, I suppose, like you said, Les will just always be there. Yeah. Uh, Peter, they want to ask you, actually, when you played against him, were you thinking, I'm better than this lad, I could play for Everton? Oh yeah, no. <laughs> it was, it, it, I say there's, there's certain players that you play against when you're a kid, and you know you, if, you know if, when you're in the changing room before a match, you might say who's you know who's the best player on their team. You'll know the lads who play for Liverpool or play for Everton or you know Preston at the time that they had a decent youth team as well. Um, but again, he, he stood out. There was a lad, there was a lad who played for Blueco called Anthony Barry. He was at Everton in the same team as him. I went to primary school with him. And um, and he'd always said about how how amazing you know Wayne Rooney was. Um, he was a name that everyone sort of knew about. Everyone everyone knew how great he was. And I think he scored. Uh, he definitely scored two. He might have scored four against us in the, in the last time we you know the last time we played against them. He was um, he was he was a special special talent. Um, I say it was just it was just a crazy thing that you you know the first time you see him on the bench for Everton, you talk in a matter of weeks before we played against Della Allen in, I think it was in the cup game. They, they'd knocked us out at our, at our home, at our home ground. And it was just, it was, it was bizarre to be honest with you. It was, it was, I, I still, him retiring has now confirmed to me that I will never play, you know, professional football. If, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's the one, that's the one thing, you know, you were saying about you feel old. Well, yeah, I think I've, I'm going to have to give up that ghost now. <laughs> yeah, probably end for all of us to be fair. But yeah, uh, yeah. I hope hopefully he does well in management, like like Patrick said. Anyway, I think he will do well at Derby. Uh, let's let's move on to have a chat about some things that are going on at Everton at the moment. Um, news about another young striker today actually has gone out on loan to Blackpool, Alice Sims, until the end of the season. Um, I think a couple of days actually after talking about how he's sort of happy at the the youth set up and how he feels like he's doing well on the David Unsworth but um, I've got to come to you first on, on this one Les uh, feels like the right time for, for Alice Sims to, to, to go out and, 
and test himself in some some really competitive environments. Yeah, I think is he twenty now. Yeah, yeah. So he's getting to that age, isn't it? Where it's kind of like you go out on loan now or never. Obviously, you have the sort of anomalies like Leon Osman who seemed to go out on loan until he was about twenty four, wasn't it? And then he <laughs> got on the first team and stayed there. Um, but yeah, you kind of think if he if he hangs around in the under twenty threes for any longer, he's not getting the the exposure to proper first team like our last football that he needs. Which you know, which Jared, Jared Brantwaite has done now, going to Blackburn as well. So that sort of shows that the club are looking at these players with a view to improving them by dropping them down and you know putting them out on loan in, in the lower league. Which is, I think, all players unless unless you are an exceptional talent like Wayne Rooney, I think most players need that sort of grounding, don't they? Because you can easily outgrow the under twenty three setup. And we've seen players do it, haven't we? They just stagnated there, and then you know they're still on the books like when they're thirty or something. It seems. <laughs> we've made up about that yeah we just we don't want it to be the new Conor McElhenney do we Patrick no that's the one <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not yeah waiting for yeah. the players when he's uh, 26 getting a, a testimonial <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I think it's a good move for him lad. Um, I think I don't know if I'm sure it was part of the plan um, but then you kind of maybe wonder why it wasn't done in August because I think it was pretty clear last season he was definitely a talent and I think maybe the maybe the kind of the thinking was that especially since we left ourselves short, letting Keane and Walcott go. And by the way, I just want to stress that I've, I've got no issue with Keane and Walcott leaving on loan. Um, a shame about Keane because I don't think he'll ever come back, but we should make money on him. And Walcott obviously needed to go, but that decision not to bring anyone in, we were shot up top and Tossum wasn't even fit at that point. So I think maybe the plan was to have Sims there and if needed, he could play. Obviously, that hasn't proved the case. He hasn't even come on in the League Cup game, did he, at all? So, it's good that he'll get out and get on loan and get some experience. And Blackpool are, a, again, it's about picking the right club. I think we should see him with Lewis Gibson at Reading, that it maybe wasn't the right club and we haven't been good at it. We've seemed to be good at picking those initial six-month loans for, like, I think Gibson did quite well at Fleetwood last season when he was, he got an injury, didn't he? But other than that, he played pretty well. So it's about picking the right loans and at the right time. And this seems like the right time for him to have a six months in the, is it Blackpool in League Two or League One? I can't League remember, one. but uh, one. League One. So yeah, it's kind of a good level for him. And then next season, we can see then if he's ready to mo- take that step up to the championship uh, or even be involved in our squad. And then it kind of makes the links to um, Xerxes at Bayern make a bit more sense as well. I mean, I think we need a player anyway in that position, a forward position. Um, I would like, uh, you know, Wilfred Zahara or Leon Bailey, but I know that's probably not realistic in this window. So if we're letting Sims go, if we're bringing in a player in Xerxes, who I think is the same age or just a bit younger, very similar type of striker, it would make sense that we're kind of testing one alone in terms of an outgoing and then we're bringing one in if we can do to get maybe that experience and see what he's like for six months as well. Yeah, I think it's clear, PD, he's not quite ready out of Sims yet for the first team football, but... You're a little bit disappointed he didn't get an opportunity maybe ahead of someone like like Cheng Tosin. You know, I, I, I've said for, for a while, I think that if we bring a, a player on with five minutes to go, then, it's, you know, trying to make a goal, it should probably be allowed to, I think, has got a, a future at the football club, albeit he, he might not be totally ready yet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think he was he was really unfortunate the, the way the, the Rotherham game sort of panned out because I think that game, would have been the one where he could come on. You know, we scored early and you, you think, you know, if we get a, another goal or two, I think we probably would have seen him and he would have had a run out. Um, but yeah, Cheng Tosin, I, I think I think most Evertonians knew um, that, that, that Tosin was a limited option for us. Um, he, he's, he's never really been able to adapt to the pace of the Premier League. The, the only thing that I think went in his favour was the fact that Carlo hadn't actually seen him. Um, you know, in the flesh, he hadn't he hadn't seen him play, so I think he was going off his reputation. Um, he probably thought that there was a, you know there was an option in there. Um, obviously, he's a, he's an experienced player. He's played in the Champions League, so I think I think it was a case of uh, you know sort of stick with what you know rather than take a risk on a on a on a young kid. Um, I'd like to see Tosin moved on in this in this window if we can, um, on the basis that we bring someone else in. I just I just don't see to be honest. I don't like to slag our players, but I don't see what he offers um, in terms of his, his general mobility, his, his, his ability to impact the game. And, and you're very right, Matt, a young player who's, who's eager to, who's hungry and eager to prove himself, um, for me, will be a better option. 
So yeah, if the lad from Bayern can come in and, and, and provide that option, that'd be that'd be a fantastic move for us. Um, and, and again, a short term deal with an option to buy is 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 a is an attractive prospect. Yeah, I think uh, Chang's spray on hair is getting more and more obvious as well, isn't it? As, as the weeks go by, I'm sure, I'm sure you've all seen the picture of him in training this week. Oh, yeah, the one in training where he, oh god, he's on my desktop now. We're playing for ten. I've heard he sent it to my dad the other day. And it's just I want to know up. where he gets it from. Oh god, Jesus! Hello. <laughs> I'll be invested. I'll, I'll be able to get rid of these hats whenever I come on if I uh, find <laughs> out where he gets them from. The thing, though, with that the spray on hair, you must have the trauma of going bald every single day. I couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> Once in a lifetime is enough, me. surely. What happens if it rains as well? You <laughs> know, if he's like mid match and he's got a, he's got like, a, you know, all of his hair and then it rains, does it all fall out? Or is it like, how does it work? Anyway. You know, like, uh, <laughs> we did the other week at that press conference where it's dripping down the side. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what if it gets in your eyes? Oh, it's thing. Well, I know, I know we had um, obviously in the Rotherham game when he scored his second goal, and uh, you know VAR and everything like that. Putting that to one side, I just couldn't get angry because he was offside because of his spray on lid, which just <laughs> completely ruined me. Well, like if he hadn't put his hair on for that game, he'd have been. He was offside by by that much. So yeah, I just I was like that is so Everton. You yeah. cannot get more Everton than that. Theory, me, yeah, but it uh, looks like he's going to be here for, for a while yet, yeah, anyway. Uh, I wonder when he's just going to give up with it uh, and just say, Do you know what, I'm just going to shave it all off. But I'm sure, I'm sure, <laughs> sure by the end got, of the just, well, got, just get a transplant, you know. I'm yeah. sure he's got enough money to go and get one. Not the money, yeah, he's the hair transplant capital of the world, isn't it? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's what he's doing. He's waiting till it all goes, and then he's gonna, you know, they're gonna perform some miracle on him. <laughs> like these pills are absolutely filthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, just just sort of on that, you you know, um, you mentioned there, Pete, in regards to you want to see us bring somebody in. It's sort of been a, a running theme on the on some of our shows this week about should we go out and spend big in this window or. You know, we should keep our powder dry in a sense because we spent quite a lot in this in the summer and you know, I think the balance sheet said we had 140 million debt uh, or a loss over the course of, of the year. That's not the right word. Um, do you feel as though it's imperative for us to go out and get a, another another forward if we're going to continue to be in this this mix for top of the table, top four, top six? It, does, does it feel that decisive to you or do you feel as though this squad have, have sort of got in and keeping the, the mix anyway? I think, I personally think that we should be adding someone. I think, you know, if, if you look at the amount of money that Mashiri spent since he's come into Everton, I know that we're in a, we're in a you know, tight spot with, with financial fair play. But if we are able to, to, to bring some money in, if we are able, to, for example, to, to, um, to sell Moise Keane to, to PSG for decent money, I think if you spend £400 million pounds, um, to try and get us in the top four, well, at this moment in time, this is the best opportunity we've had since Mashiri's come in to get that top four. We're halfway through the season. I think if he if he wants to invest, if this is the time, if he was ever going to take a gamble, I think this is the time. Um, I think if you were going to go the other way and try and pick someone up, you know, on the cheap, Josh King did, for me, look like a decent option, only because of the fact that the Dominic Alvett loom would be our first choice. I think King could come in and do a decent job, certainly against some of, some of the more physical sides, I think. I think Josh King could have could have done a decent job at a decent price. However, it sounds like he's he's pricing himself out with his wages. Um, it's it's a it is a balancing act because what you don't want to do is go out and and give someone a, a big contract and then be stuck with them, which is unfortunately why we're in the position we're in at the moment, where we've got a lot of players on big money um, who are who are bleeding the club dry in terms of financial fair play. So I think it's imperative that we we try and get rid of some of these players um, and hopefully. If we can add one or two players into that squad, I think we can really push for that top four. Yeah, I think, as you, you mentioned on Twitter earlier in the week, that this is a, a great opportunity and you want to see us sort of go go for it. And, you know, I'm, I'm very much of, of that, that that mindset most of the time. I think it, but, but I think just to go back to what you said there, it does feel imperative that we get someone out the door on big money first. And, you know, the obvious one is Moise Keane, who's been linked with, with PSG and, you know, 30-odd million and that kind of thing. But... 
Apart from that, maybe Bernard for ten million if we can get get in. You know, there's been reports about him going to, to Dubai having the, the last the last mm-hmm. couple of days, but it feels as though before we can do anything and find that player, as hard as it is to find that, that someone who's on big wages and command a decent fee goes out the door. Yeah, and the, the, there's not really many saleable assets, as you say, Bernard. You know, he, even if we only got ten million for him, which isn't isn't a lot at all, it's clear profit, isn't it? Because we got him for nothing, and it gets a massive wage. Off the wage bill, um, obviously Keane is our most saleable option, and I think at this moment in time, as you said, if we can get the money for him now and reinvest it straight away, I think that would be the ideal situation for us because I can't see him. I think Pat said before I can't see him coming back ever, and I don't even think he's got the inclination to come back. I, I don't think he. I'm not convinced he ever wanted to be at Everton. Um, mm. The whole transfer was just completely, completely mad to me. Just on the January thing. I think it'll be really frustrating if we don't strengthen the team now, given the fact that we did in the January that Allardyce was in charge. So it was like Machiri really panicked then. And you could see because he appointed Allardyce. But he really panicked that we could go down and everything he's done will be like a hundred times harder, you know, to, to get us back into the league and then challenge it again. But then he threw off 40 million, was it? I think Walcott was 20, wasn't yeah, he? Walcott and Tosin. Uh, yeah. Not the same, million. really. Yes, 40, 45 million. You know, so to do that, to sort of stave off possible relegation that was never really on the cards, Allardyce well talked them into that, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, lad, we're down here. Unless we sign some players, we're down. <laughs> um, to, not, to not do it now would be dead disappointing. And it, it just seems like it's another... You look at Selim Rooney. That was a massive opportunity missed because we didn't get the money we should have got for him. I think United paid 18 million for Ronaldo. At the same time, you know, three, four times the player he was at the time. Um, and it, it just feels like that could be another missed opportunity like that where we've got something we can just build on just one or two seasons maybe. This is the chance to do it. If we don't, it could blow up on our face and we'll be really disappointed. Just just before we come to you on this, Patrick, just, just very quickly, Les, is, is this not the, the collateral of, of that though? You know, that, that spell you mentioned there where we went out to <laughs> 45 million in January out of blind panic and we probably didn't really need to. And yeah, yeah maybe the manager the summer after we, we got Koeman in and sacked him and paid off all his staff, same with Silver, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it feels as though while it's it's great and ideally you want to invest from a position of strength, when you've made as many bad decisions as we have, it's <laughs> when you eventually get to that position of strength, there's there's a lot of ground to be made, you know. Oh yeah, it, it, I mean machinery will have PTSD, I reckon, over everything and on between <laughs> And, and, and a point in Ancelotti, to be honest. Um, yeah, you, you know, that will that will be his frame of reference, won't it? That you can't just be throwing mm. bad, money after bad money after bad money. This is different, though, because we've got Ancelotti, who clearly knows yeah. what he's doing. Get a tune out of these players. You've just got to back him. I think I think the striker one is the, the strike is the pressing issue, isn't it? Because as we've seen, if we haven't got Calvert Lewin and, and Richarlison can't fit in there, pretty short up front. Yeah, uh, Patrick, you're nodding along with, with Les there. You want to see Everton go out and, and sign someone who can yeah, contribute as well? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think my frustration maybe isn't as much with the fact, not the fact, but, you know, like the kind of suspicion that Mashiri wouldn't back us. I think he would. I think if Ancelotti and Brands went to Mashiri right now and said, if Ancelotti, you know, they said, give us 30 million or 40 million and we will get Champions League this season, Mashiri would believe it. Mashiri believes in Ancelotti, and rightly so, and I think he believes in Brands. And this isn't a criticism of Ancelotti or Brands. I, I'm kind of on the fence with Brands. I think he's done a very good job with a lot of things, but we mentioned like past you know, past issues kind of catching up with us. Well, Brands has contributed to that. Um, without getting into the who's signing were the managers or the director of football or whatever, you know, Brands did sign off on a deal to give Bernard 120 grand a week. He did sign off on, you know, um, certain new contracts or or anything like that. And also with moving players out, I sometimes feel like I would proactive enough in it. But I think if, yeah, I think in this window, we just have this opportunity to add that one bit of quality that we really need. But my frustration comes that we, you know, the, the last transfer window only ended three months ago. And we're in exactly the same position now as we were then. We knew we needed another forward. And I just don't understand why we couldn't have maybe pushed the boat out that bit more in that last transfer window, rather than saying we'll get to January and look then, when we know that January is not a good time to do business. 
so it's just that frustration. It is a it is a balancing act, but you know, someone who that forward just to alternate those positions. And I think as I, I think I mentioned it before, but Everton fans we have this, and I think it comes from that, those years when we had no money and we were operating on a, a shoestring squad kind of thing, a skeleton squad. You need. 12, 13 players that are top quality in any squad to get you top four. You just do. And obviously the best sides have 18, 19 players. And we have a, we never, we need to get away from this idea that we have the first 11 because I don't think Ancelotti even believes that really. He knows that, you know, that first, that kind of strongest team that we played in the first four games of the season. I doubt we'll see those together again more than once or twice this season just because of injuries and suspensions and COVID and everything else. So we need to get away from that kind of idea of just having that first 11 and wondering about, well, if we spend 25 million on one player and they don't start, then it's a waste of money and we'll need to punt someone else. You need to kind of speculate to accumulate in a way. So I really would want to see us in these last two weeks just go out and kind of get that difference maker. At yeah. the moment, it looks like it's going to have to be on loan. But I think, you know, the right loan deal, a loan to buy, um, a an 18 month loan, even something like that. Those options are available. It's just about, you know, finding the right club and the right player, but there's definitely options there. And at the moment we're more attractive to players than we ever have been in the last five or 10 years. Yeah. I think you say the word difference maker there. And I think that, that would obviously be great, but I don't even think it, we need right now in January, that sort of player, you know, I've, I've been saying Enna Valencia's name on this show for a yeah. while, the last week. And I think someone like him will be, you know, I, think, I was just thinking then about striking options of teams who are like around us. And you look at look at Leicester and obviously they've, they've got Vardy, who is effectively their Calvert Lewin, who plays every game, scores most of the goals, is, is, you know, probably the best player. But you look beyond him as well. And if he's not fit, obviously there's going to be issues in the team. But they've got Ian Acho, who is fine. He's, he's, a, he's a good Premier League striker. They've got Jose Perez again. Not the best, but he can play across that front three, do a job in all those positions, and he and he's fine in those areas. You know, the both upgrades are someone like Cheng Tosin. So you know, I think you've yeah, ever seen that, up- sorry, mate, go on. So that's the point, yeah. That I don't necessarily mean kind of I'd love it, but I don't necessarily mean that Zaha Bailey kind of quality just yet, because those plays are obviously hard to get, but that difference maker in terms of someone to bring off the bench, I think you, we've still not had a substitute who scored in the league this season. And we've seen Iwobi step up recently and he's kind of made this kind of good squad of 11 or 12 players into a good squad of 12 or 13 now and we can kind of rely on him and that's down to his hard work and Ancelotti. It's just having another player who can come on and add something and yet he doesn't necessarily need to be a 30, 40 million player. Josh King could be a good option and I mean, I don't buy that anybody is going to... And I'm sure him and his agent know that nobody will pay him 120 grand a week. I think that's him kind of thinking, well, if I end up at West Ham, can I get the best deal out of them? He's been linked with Burnley today and I don't think he'd want to move to Burnley. I think he would to get out of the Championship, but I don't necessarily think he'd want to see himself at Burnley. And if he says, well, I want 100 grand a week, Burnley aren't going to go anywhere near that. I kind of think if Everton came to him and said, we'll offer you 60 grand a week and a two and a half year contract, I think Josh King would jump at it right now. And that's not big in Everton up. I just think, we're such a step up from where Bournemouth are and we've got such a good manager and we've got such a good chance to really push on. He could see himself as part of that and I think he'd jump at the opportunity. So I think talk of like him pricing himself out of the move, it's just kind of all that cloak and dagger stuff that goes on behind the scenes, really. Yeah, and I think even with Moyes in charge, West Ham are probably going to be more sensible now. So you can't really imagine well, that. exactly, yeah, we'll exactly. Grand him as well. So, yeah, we'll have to wait and see on that one. Uh, just before we wrap up today, Pete, uh, the girls are back in action at the weekend for the first time in almost a month. Uh, A lot of games off uh, during the festive period, first game of the year. And it looked like the rest had done them loads of good because they absolutely battered Bristol City 4-0. Izzy, Christine sit on the score sheet twice, Simone, McGill and Meg Finnegan as well. It looked like the the break had just really revitalised them after a bit of a tough end of the year. Absolutely, um, the, you know they, they came out. They came out fighting. They, they were one up after about four minutes. Got a second uh, before half time. Um, the second half was was pretty straightforward as well. Um, one of the best things about it was the fact that Valerie Gorvan um, and Rika Savecki both both uh, came off the bench. So that they 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 were missing for for a number of games before Christmas. They were they were huge losses for Everton. So. Um, you know th- those results that we had. We had a bit of a bad spell again. You know we lost against City, Arsenal, uh, Chelsea. 
Um, those two players, Valerie Govan and, and Rika Zavecki, well, they're, a, they're the difference makers. They're the, they're the ones who, who take us up a level. Um, I thought the team on, on Sunday were absolutely superb. The, the, they, they seem to be back to their best. They were full of confidence. Um, we still got a few more players to come back from injury as well. Uh, Claire Emsley uh, has just signed on a permanent deal. She, she was uh, on a short-term deal, but she signed on a permanent deal. She's out injured at the moment, but she's a fantastic player to be coming in. Um, unfortunately, we've lost uh, Damaris Egarola. Uh, she's gone to Leon today. She's it's, you know finalised her her move today, which is a shame. Um, we we couldn't do anything about that one because they met a release clause. Uh, but hopefully, we can uh, we can improve, bring a bring a player in to replace her. I've heard I've heard a few names mentioned, and if it, if it is one of those names, then I think I think we can all be very happy with that. Um, you know, it's. I think it's a time now for us to, to, to kick on. Unfortunately, our game tonight against Birmingham has been called off because of a waterlogged yeah. pitch. Um, un- again, unfortunately, that's just the, you know the nature of the beast that, um, in, in the WSL. A lot of the a lot of the pitches and a lot of the, the stadiums that, that the teams play at, um, you know, they, they they do suffer from waterlogged pitches and uh, and a lot of cancellations. So it's going to be a tough couple of months, I think, to catch up with some of the fixture congestion. Um, I know that the FA Cup is is um, at the moment it's being discussed as to how they're gonna they're gonna try and get the FA Cup done this season. Um, there, there was one mention about you know having a coin a coin toss, sorry, um, for some of the earlier rounds, which is oh, quite frankly yeah. ridiculous. They're better off just just cancelling it and, and and playing it next year, you know, and just moving on to next season. But um, but yeah, in terms of Everton, I think we've we've uh, we, we've hopefully um, turned a bit of a corner again. Uh, we've got players back fit who are, who are important players, and and yeah, we can hopefully kick on and uh, and get back to our best. Yeah, and just one player I wanted to to speak about with you before we finish. Uh, at the end of the year, we did our Blue Room Players of the Year for, for the lads and the girls, and sort of speaking to you about who've been the, the best players for the girls this year, and you know, rattled off some very familiar names. And one that you did mention that you actually said would have been your Player of the Year, and we don't really speak about probably enough. Mm. is uh, Meg Finnegan on the score sheet at the weekend clean sheet um, seems as though she's currently on a really encouraging development path oh absolutely I mean she's been at Everton for 10 years she's she's come right you know up through the, the, the ranks at Everton um, it was her first goal for, for Everton she actually scored about three or four in pre-season and we were all sort of saying to her you know you're, you're going to get your first your first proper goal now um, so I think she's going to be going to be made up to have got that you know um, but Meg is the improvement from Meg over the last two seasons, in particular, has been absolutely incredible. Uh, she, when I first, you know, saw, saw Meg play, she was she was almost like a defensive midfielder, or you know, she was a, or like a sweeper. Do you know what I mean? Or played in a three. Um, but when Gabby George got injured last season, Meg has just stepped up, and she's been absolutely incredible. She's she's been a, a real leader at the back. Um, you know, she's she's great on the ball. She's fantastic in the air. Um, a real, a really classy centre half, but also she loves the club. She absolutely bleeds blue. You know, in in the run up to the FA Cup final, I was I was fortunate enough to be involved in it with a Zoom call with uh, with Meg, with Shiny Boy Lorca and Dan Turner. And the way Meg spoke about the club, it was it was just a, a pleasure to hear. Um, you know, she's a she's a proper a proper blue. Um, so I'm just delighted for her, and I think she's she's got all the potential in the world. She's played for England up till. You know the under twenty one level. Um, I I think she's got a huge future ahead of her, and I wouldn't be surprised to see her getting a call up very soon. Because if she if she did get that call up, she'd massively deserve it. Absolutely, uh, good stuff there. Hopefully, we continue that and get as many games on as possible over the next few weeks. Uh, we are out of time today. Uh, cheers to all the lads for coming on, and of course to Super Kev Campbell as well for joining us earlier. Uh, we'll be previewing the game at the weekend against Sheffield United. Uh, Sheffield United, Sheffield Wednesday, and that ridiculous. <laughs> Sunday night kickoff time. Uh, we're going to watch the score at some point, won't we, lads? Yeah, we'll, we'll sort that. Yeah, yeah. Sunday night before the game, who knows? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, thanks very much to everyone for listening and for watching. If you're listening, give us a rating, give us a review. And as ever, if you want to hear more from us, why not come over and join us on Patreon, on the Blue Room Extra, uh, multiple Everton shows every weekday, analysing and reflecting on all of Everton's games. Uh, Patreon.com slash the Blue Room Extra if you want to get involved in that. If not, we'll speak to you again soon here on the weekly show. Take care.